And now I want to talk about what things are like today in terms of our, our, our overall planet and what's, what's going on here in California, et cetera. With this cool, now we don't have this particular species here in California. We have the genus Paralabrax. And this, I like this, yeah, this was by Darwin uh, when he was sailing around the world in the Beagle. Um, a cool uh, serranid. So again, let's, let's recall that the overall framing of all this stuff, the public opinion poll stuff you guys are doing, our seafood surveys are about to start, our, our early lectures, middle stuff, all this stuff, it's all about this central question, has the coastal zone become too complex to manage? Is it too hard? Is, is, are the challenges too deep? Are the, are the people too divided? Whatever. So keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, to start with, just want to um, reiterate a few things. Uh, the vast majority of the world's living biomass, not decayed biomass, but living biomass is in the ocean. We harvest a relatively small percentage of all that biomass. And by just looking at that, that might seem that we have, oh, we only harvest, you know, a fraction of a percent of all this biomass per year. Wow, we could probably suck out a bunch more stuff. No, no. The dynamics of this planet that have things that produce oxygen for you to breathe and, and, and other members and food for other members of this ecosystem we live on, all that jazz, um, we've pretty much, we're getting, we've, we've either maxed out or we're essentially maxed out um, with regards to that. Even though it looks like, it might look at, at like an engineering approach, might say, oh, we could take more stuff, no. We're, we right now are, it's on the order, I'll show you the most recent data, but, but roughly it's been the same for a while, about a fifth of the protein that, that we as a species get, we get from marine sources. And if you want to add taking those marine fish, things like sardines and et cetera, grinding them up into fish meal and feeding those to chicken, if you add that protein pathway, it's more like about a fourth or so of our protein comes from the ocean. Um, and while you and I, by and large, see seafood as a luxury, we can't forget that for certain chunks of the world, especially in the developing world, this is not a luxury, this is not a choice thing, this is eat to survive, or if we don't eat this food item, we don't eat at all. <clears throat> and, and the biggest concentration of dependence on marine sources of food um, is <clears throat> in the greater uh, Asian continent. This first. Okay, let's talk about how we harvest. So all this data we're about to talk about consists of uh, harvesting from a whole variety of sources. Later when we get into our seafood surveys, you guys will need to understand a little teeny bit more of this, but, but by and large notice these are all the w traditional ways we have commercially harvested uh, items from the sea. There are other more what we might call artisanal or very small scale methods, but by and large this is what we're talking about when we talk about uh, global catch data, global landings data. <coughs> Harpoons, we talked about that, you guys saw examples of that when we talked about whales and whaling. Pole and line, this is exactly what it sounds like, this is a fishing pole and a single fishing line that goes to a hook and, and we, we fish for that. That was a huge industry in California in the post-World War II years. San Diego was a massive tuna fishing port. Los Angeles, massive tuna fishing port. Most of that was caught by uh, burly folks that sat all day long and, and, and you know, muscled the fish out of the ocean. <clears throat> now that's rarely done, but that's an important uh, category when we talk about sustainably harvested because that is a very targeted way to fish. You know exactly the fish you got and if you pull it up on board, you, you pull it up because you know you want it. Um, not a lot of bycatch, for example, with the pole and line fishery. Long line, this is where we um, uh, uh, lay out a, a, a long line, as it sounds, one main line with a lot of sub lines, a lot of sub hooks, and this is a large <clears throat> ocean going a typically ocean-going type approach, and we would trawl this, we would drag this um, 
uh, line behind us for, for miles and miles and miles potentially, and it's a relatively indiscriminate fishing method because a lot of fish could potentially get. Uh, gill netting, we've, we've touched on this before. This is where we allow this float, yeah. Um, well, it can be nice, but it's, it's, it's mostly just dragging stuff. So trolling is dragging hooks. Um, <clears throat> no, but it could be near the bottom, okay. not, not on. On the bottom so would be, trolling. correct, trolling is dragging the fishing lines. Uh, drift netting or gill netting is where we have the net <clears throat> that has a, you know, typically nowadays it's monofilament. And this is and this is where the f it's it's either left in place or it might be attached to floating buoys, which might slowly be moving through the water, but basically it's still relative to the fish. The fish swim up to that object and they attempt to go through that object, and they're able to put their forehead, the, the front part of their heads through. It's not foreheads. What the hell? <laughs> it's like uh, I got a PhD. Um, anyway, uh, they go through. <laughs> And, and the front part of their head goes through, but then when it gets, you know, they're, most of these fish are torpedo shaped, when it starts to get farther up, gets past their gills, and then they're like, dang it, I'm too fat to get through this hole. And so then the typical response, just like if you guys got stuck in a hole, is to wiggle back out. But when they try to do that, fish are breathing, and most of these guys have, oper they have these covers over their gills. Those guys get stuck, like a one-way, just like a one-way trap, and then the fish are trapped there. So all these being legal commercial harvest methods? Uh, these are, in different areas, these are all legal, yes. I mean, certain areas might be banned, but we're just talking about the different ways people could be doing it. So these are all used in different parts of the world right now. <clears throat> um, okay, uh, right, trawl is we're dragging um, uh, nets uh, through either the shallow water or the uh, bottom of the ocean. The ones, the ones in the water are just a net in the water. The ones that are in the bottom usually have some type of tire, some type of, um, uh, typically the, the things are called otter trawls where they have these planks that, that force the net to be open. But the point is uh, they, they skim along the bottom and they ideally don't hit the bottom but they just are very close to the bottom and they just sort of skim over and they, they capture all of the fish. The fish are swimming for a while and they might be staying just in the mouth of the net and then eventually the, the fish tire and they get they get caught in the back of the net. Um, seines or, or so-called purse seines, these are purses. These, these are a, a circular net. So we would go and let's say yeah, I wanted to capture you guys, I would lay an, a walled net around the back of the room off the side here behind me out to the hall and then through like a, like a cinch purse we have a, a a cinch at the bottom, we cinch the bottom up. And all of a sudden, our bottom exit closes. And then we're like, what? And then you, you drag the whole net and you catch everybody. These are typically for schooling organisms, things like uh, uh, tunas and um, sardines and things like that. And so they get trapped. And, then, and, and because they are schooling, by putting one little net, we can get a large volume of fish in one, one uh, grab. And then we have things like traps and pots. These are, fiz these are rigid structures typically that are um, mostly on the bottom of the, on the benthos. And, and they're usually baited with some type of, of decaying or, or old fish part or something. Most of these guys are scavengers, so they'll come on in to scavenge, smell that thing come in. And, and they, again, it's, it's an easy to get in door and there's different designs. Some have a trap door, some have more just like a uh, an easy to get in way, and then it's hard to get out. Uh, and then uh, the last broad category, which isn't widely used, but it's one of the widely ones used here in Southern California, so I want to talk about it, and that would be how we get squid typically. So we get our lolligo, our market squid, by using light boats. So these squid are positively phototactic, uh, meaning they swim towards the light. So we, the fish boats go out in the evening time, turn on these big giant lights, just like you'd see at a concert or a football game or something like that. Very, very, very bright. Light up the ocean like it's daylight. And, and just on the edge of the, of, of the water, just on the edge of the ship, and these um, squid think it's the moon, and they swim up to the moon, and then they get uh, caught. <clears throat> they, they can be caught with nets, or they can be caught with so-called jigs, which are basically just hooks. 
So we go in, or sometimes the jig is a flashing thing, a lighted thing, and, and depends, on the, depends on the squid species, they're like, I'm gonna get that, and they grab on, and then you suck them in. Those jigs are unbaited. Those jigs don't have, they're not like some of the other fishing lines where you put some kind of bait on. Um, for example, Humboldt squid get so ravenous, they'll grab onto anything that's down there. So those are, those are some of our basic fishing methods. Yeah, Michael. So, uh, oh, excellent question. Great question. So Michael's question is about uh, harvesting algae. And so most algae these days that's harvested is, har is, is, is farmed. We'll talk about mariculture later. But, um, but great question. Uh, in some areas, like in California, for our abalone farms, we actually harvest wild kelp. We, we, we harvest, um, and, and hopefully we'll see that in our trip. Um, but what our local producers use here in California is they use old decommissioned World War II landing craft. Modif so this is a very unusual, this would, I would put this more into the artisanal thing. This isn't, this isn't mainstream. But basically what they do, you take a landing craft and they lower the front of the boat and they basically have like tuk, 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 cutters and they drive the, drive the boat onto the, the kelp canopy. And kelp is incredibly productive. It's one of these things we can cut it off and they'll grow fantastically quickly. In the peak growth time, we've had, we've had a kelp that's grown more than 18 inches. So one frond more than 18 inches in 24 hours. So they grow incredibly fast. And that's one frond, right? The deepest, I believe the deepest recorded kelp individual is at 386 feet. And they have multiple stipes with hundreds and hundreds of fronds each stipe. So you think of that, hundreds of feet and every single blade potentially, or at least many of them, are growing at one foot per day, massive biomass producer. That's one of the reasons that we have some of the most incredible reefs in the world here off of California, especially Southern California, and, and, and why one of the reasons why our, our kelp reefs are so diverse and so awesome, because we're constantly sh sh sloughing off all this food for, for critters that are gonna eat this and use this as refuge. So in that case, they, we play on that and they go and they shave off just the top of the canopy with the, with the landing craft, shave it off, and then drive the boat uh, you know, so and then suck the basically suck the kelp onto deck, and then and then they drive back home, unload it, and feed it to the algae, uh, feed it feed it to the um, abalone. Excuse me. So that that would be the uh, sort of commercial scale stuff. But most of the algae that we're going to get for nori, you know, seaweed wraps, that kind of stuff, we're actually farming in in a place where you and I would harvest it by hand, kind of thing, on land. We mentioned this before, but I just want to touch on it again because we're about to look at some of the data. So here are the four broad, uh, as I say, the, the, the four broadest categories of, um, of fish stocks, fish landings. We have demersal, or sometimes called ground fish. These are guys that live right next to the benthos. We have fish that are up swimming in the water column, the pelagic fish. We then have crustaceans. So this would be your lobsters, your shrimp. Uh, your crab, oh, or as I call it, your crad. Apparently, I need to fix that slide. Um, yeah, crad. It's a new thing. It's all the rage. Um, uh, and then, and then, lastly, mollusks. Right. So this would be these would be both our abalone type guys and our snail type guys, but also our cephalopods. So things like cuttlefish, things like a squid, and things like octopus. So if you have a no, right here, I, I left some things blank. I said we harvest X number of millions uh, tons per year. So I have an exercise for us to do. How exciting, participatory stuff going on here. Okay, table three is up here. It's just hard to see, so I've given you guys a table. And you guys need to tell me. So you guys need to pull out each of the species you have at your table or your group. Everybody should have one. And you guys need to figure out if it's, uh, d well, if it's a fish. Most of, these, most of these guys are fish. There's a, there's a crab here, there's a shrimp here. But um, if you guys are a fish, you need to figure out if it's demersal or pelagic. So great, so good, good quick addition, you guys. So uh, just skimming, skimming it really quickly, we're talking on the order of about six million tons of demersal stuff, about uh, 24 million tons of pelagic, about 1.2 million tons of crustaceans, and about two million tons of mollusks just of the most popular ones, right? There's gonna be, these numbers are gonna be higher if we add up every single species. But that gives us a rough estimate. So we take a lot of pelagic, good amount of demersal, and then 
the the mollusks and the crust in the invertebrate the invertebrates make a, a smaller um, chunk, although uh, very expensive on price per pound, pretty pretty expensive. Yeah, we've sort of touched on this, but I want to be clear: these four different factors. Traditionally, traditionally we think about it this way. So in the middle we have our, our stock or our population of fish, and we have additions and subtractions. So what are those additions going to be? How can we make how can we make more biomass than this guy? Yes. Deaths and fishing. Exactly right. So that that's a traditional view of our marine stocks that we have we have recruitment coming in we have little guys getting bigger and then we have natural so-called natural mortality in quotes and then we have our our harvest or a catch sucking things out we'll talk real briefly about our sardine story because i think this is this is illustrative so this is the classic sardine story this is the this is the fish that birthed monterey uh john steinbeck wrote about it um, this led to Cannery Row. This is why we now have the Monterey Bay Aquarium where we have it. There's all kinds of influences on our, our, the history of our state. But the first important number is our very first cannery starts in 1889 in the state of California. So this is a cannery is where we, we capture the fish, we do something to them, typically prepare them, cook them, steam them, do something, and then put them in this container and then you can archive them. So this is, this is preservation technology. So this now means that not only are the people at the coast able to consume this, this item, but now people inland or, or outside of the fishing season, et cetera. So it allows there to be greater consumption than of just um, people trying to sustain their, their own energy uh, uh, needs right at the coast. Initially, we're catching these folks from the sandy beach with, with uh, nets, basically. Um, as it continues to get to grow over the in, ensuing years, the technology improves, just like all of our fishing. We figure out what works, what doesn't work. We figure out how to be more efficient at removing individuals, etc. cetera. Um, we, and by 1905, we introduced this first type of net, which is off to the right, which is a much more efficient way of dragging through these schools and, and getting these guys. There's so many of them, people start to say, ah, this is a plentiful resource. Let's, let's, let's figure out what else we can do with this wonderful, uh, never-ending stream of fish biomass. So we start to turn them into uh, materials for other industrial processes or other food processes, so fish meal and fish oil. So we reduce the whole fish into constituent components, basically. And, uh, and then that, that the industry is getting bigger and bigger the whole time. We're, we're taking more and more stuff. Now, after it's been going for a couple decades in the 1920s, California Department of Fish and Game, what we now call the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, biologists start to get worried. They're seeing a reduction in catch per unit effort. They're seeing a reduction in the age of the individuals that we bring into the, to the canneries. And fishermen are starting to report that they have to go farther and farther away to get the same amount of, of landings. Um, continues on, continues on. We have the peak record in 1936, and it's only downhill from here. Again, the first warning sign is in the 20s. Decade later, uh, oh, maybe something is not right, right? So the, the Game Commission, which is the entity, the government entity that, that's figuring out what we can do, how much stuff we can harvest, they say we're seeing unmistakable signs of depletion and we really need to reduce our harvests. And then immediately the next year, all those guys are fired by the governor because the fishermen don't want to hear that. So we've seen some of these quotes before, but for example, this is in 1922 um, by one of the bio scientists for the state, our state agency regulating this resource, says there's every reason to believe that the problem is near at hand. Our fishery has advanced farther than we have perhaps dreamed. They have perhaps gone too far. And then uh, one of the, so again, saying maybe something's not, not great here, but not, not going out and saying stop. And then we have a, a classic canner here who says, it's absurd for anyone who really knows the facts to say that you can deplete the supply of sardines in the Pacific Ocean. Ho, 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 ho. Uh, then we start to see that we've depleted this sardine in the Pacific Ocean. Um, 
Oh, now this is partly a story of over-harvesting, taking too many, but it's also a story of environmental complexity, as so many of our coastal marine management issues are. So in this case, we see a shifted regime, oceanic regime. Different water temperature, different productivity, it, that, that changes every few decades, known, which what we now recognize, we didn't know what to call it back then, we now know it as the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, or so-called PDO. And at this, at this, um, and so we had a different regime in the middle when we were catching all these great fish, and essentially the oceanic conditions change. The feds take over the fishery during World War II to use it as important protein for, for troops fighting overseas. And, uh, and then that, that basically just drives it uh, into, um, into oblivion. A few years later, the Southern California population crashes. And, uh, and, and it takes several decades. We finally see a small recovery of especially the Southern California population. And we now have a relatively small scale sustainable fishery out of a few ports, out of uh, Monterey and a few other ports. So this is what the picture looks like. So this is uh, all of the West Coast sardine landings and then just us here in Southern California in red. But you see, we were always only a small fraction of the total sardine landings here off of Ventura and Southern California. Um, but we, we've also recovered, generally speaking, recovered. Um, so this is both, a again, both a story of over-harvesting and altered environmental conditions. Both these things are going on at the same time. To say that blame only one without the other is an incorrect picture. Okay, so next I want to show you guys some data from our friend Donna. She, she was my, one of my TAs when I was an undergrad. She now works for the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management here in Camarillo. And she gave this great talk last year, and it, I liked it so much. I said, hey, can I, can I, can I use that talk for, uh, for my class? She said, sure. So these are her slides that she uh, has wonderfully compiled uh, for us. And so, um, so she first presented this at the California Island Symposium. I think she gave it again at Western Society of Naturalists. But um, it's a great talk, and I, I really like it because it's very hyper-local in terms of what our fishery uh, production is doing. And so thanks to the good Dr. Schroeder. So she went in and she looked at landings data. Again, the data we have are the data um, where the fish that, so, so fishermen are out there fishing, they catch the fish, they bring them back, and then where they land them, where it touches the pier, where it touches the dock, that's where we record them. Generally speaking, where you see these major uh, port complexes, the red dots here in California, that's generally where the people are fishing, but not always. So in some cases, some of the dots up in Northern California, they actually caught their fish farther south and vice versa. But grossly, grossly, people are generally fishing vaguely close to where they, where they uh, are landing. So we're gonna look at our Santa Barbara uh, landings. And so uh, this is, Let's take a look at all the commercial landings. And so this is data from 2005 to 2015, this decade long period. So we're gonna, I'm gonna show, it to, show them to you in a couple different ways. This first is by a cash value. This is not the value that you pay for them. This is the value that the fishermen get for them when, they, when it touches the dock and they sell it to the wholesaler or the canner or, or whoever is uh, purchasing it from the uh, fishermen. And so we can look at the rank in terms of which port is bringing in the most amount of money and check it out. Santa Barbara, and that's also where, you know, a lot of our Ventura County fishermen uh, are landing their stuff. Um, number one, but not just number one, number one by a fairly good margin, right? LA is big. Eureka in the far northern part of the state is big. Everybody else is much smaller than our landings. In terms of gross biomass, uh, LA beats us, but we're pretty darn close, right? LA and Santa Barbara are, are quite different from the rest of the state in terms of the biomass harvested. And if we talk about in terms of the number of species, uh, our local area has the most diversity, has, has the highest species richness of, of food fish landed, or I should say seafood landed. This is what that looks like. Here are some of the, the value leaders. In this case, this is um, listing from the most valuable down. 
Did you guys know that uh, market squid are our most valuable fishery in California? Uh, why? Because people love to eat calamari. And these are incredibly prolific critters. So boats and boats and boats and boats and boats full of them. When they, yeah. That's what they're doing off of the blue, right? Correct. So Correct. So Brittany's question is, uh, do we see that at night? Yes. Yeah. So the, the typical fishing places are off of Malibu. Um, and particularly, there's a little there's a little hole just south of Point Magoo where a lot of them will. will so what's happening is these these squid are aggregating to reproduce. They lay these egg cases, and so that they're concentrating to fertilize the eggs and everything. And so that's where they're that's when they're targeted. And so the the targeted places, the uh, classically heavily hit places are off of Catalina Island, and right here off of uh, for our region Catalina, and then right off of. Uh, uh, the Malibu coast are the two most popular places. Uh, anyway, so, so there you go. So um, uh, the, the average annual value is $20 million in raw, raw cost uh, or, or, or raw um, expense. Um, interesting as a side note, we have no production facility for um, processing, I should say processing, we have no processing facility for squid in California. There's a few little artisanal things. You guys can go buy some squid from the fishermen off, off, the, off the, the docks and the, port, and the ports in a few places. But yeah, Josiah. Oh, um, would you consider this as an example of like fishing down the food? Good question. So Josiah, is, is this an example of fishing down the food web? In this case, no. People have always eaten squid, I would say, or for a long time have eaten squid. Um, a lot of the initial squid fishermen are from Italy. Uh, the tr one of the traditional big places where people fish squid is in the Mediterranean. So a lot of our Italian immigrants became some of the first uh, squid uh, 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 fishermen. But, but for as long as we've had a fishery in Southern California, we've had at least some uh, squid activity going on. Um, it's clearly risen in value as some of the other fish stocks have gone down, but, but we, we, haven't, we didn't shift to it because we were on something else. So I, so I think what Elise is thinking about is is the indirect effect of, of sea otters on kelp forests, right? We talked about this before. So the sea otters eat the things that either graze or might harm the kelp. So when you have a lot of sea otters, you tend to knock down things like sea urchins and there tends to be a lot of kelp. That's what I think you guys are thinking of. Would it actually be beneficial that we're maybe like self-monitoring? So yes. So. So generally speaking, I think it's, it's pretty well acknowledged that because we've, we don't have many sea otters here in Southern California, they're recolonizing slowly. That's a whole other story. But, but um, we sort of are serving as an eco, sort of ecologically, we're sort of an analog for the sea otters. So, so we're helping keep those sea urchin populations down so they don't totally nuke the kelp bed is one interpretation. Of course, we can over, over harvest and stuff, but that's sort of what seems to be going on. Okay, so we so market squid super valuable, followed by lobster, um, what we call rock lobster. This is you know not main lobster, not with the big claws. We eat the tails mostly um, for our our species. Um, uh, sea urchins, spot prawns, crustaceans, crabs, other prawns, white sea bass, really really popular, delicious fish, and then we we go on down. So some of these things we don't really we very rarely consume here. Market squid we eat. Oh, I, I didn't finish that story. So we don't have a processing facility here. All of the squid that you eat in the stores, all the, or, or virtually all, all the squid that you eat in restaurants is flash frozen, put on a slow haul cargo ship, goes to China, is thawed, processed, prepared, cooked, or whatever it needs to be done, or just refrozen, filleted, whatever, and then put back on another cargo ship that's going to come slow haul back here and then you buy it as local California squid. Merry Christmas. Okay, so you guys can pick out your favorite thing. I'll just so that, say that uh, a subset of this stuff is specifically for export. The red urchin, some people eat uni. Does anybody, here, anybody in here eat uni? One, two, three, four. Four, five. Most people do not care for uni. That mostly goes to the Asian markets. Uh, similarly, warty sea cucumber. Most of you folks do not enjoy warty sea cucumber. Again, Asian export. Okay, anyway, so you, you can pick out your favorite thing. So this is, 
This is annual landings. And then these are uh, critters that are tightly associated with our rocky reefs, our kelp forests. So the, the non-green ones are just more pelagic or offshore or something. The green guys are tightly associated with our uh, shallow water rocky reefs. Here are, are um, a bit more, these are not the most valuable, but these are some of the more notable things. We, have, we get Big Eye Tuna, three quarters of a million dollars uh, sold at the, at the um, docks, etc. And again, uh, a fair amount of these are guys that are tightly associated with our rocky reefs. Um, when you add it all up, you're talking about more than $5 million in just that raw, uh, you know, sale at the point of the landing um, per year. And, uh, and so this is, this is a lot, this is a, a valuable fishery, I would say it that way. Um, this is, this is California wide. This is for the whole state and 11% of the raw value of these, of these, uh, fish stocks coming into the Harbor are coming from our, uh, rocky reef habitats. Here, here's what some of this kelp looks like. And the Donna's gone in, uh, <coughs> excuse me, this is, um, this is surf, surface kelp at maximum extent sort of this time of year or just a month or so ago, basically. So late summer, early fall. And then um, uh, she's gone in and she's made a couple different zones. So one of the challenge with working with this data is that um, we uh, don't have exact GPS locations. Instead, we have these so-called fishing blocks. We have these areas that are relatively large geographic area. And the fisherman says, hey, I caught my lobster in there. That's because that's for a variety of reasons. Um, that's because fishermen don't like to tell you exactly where their favorite fishing spot is, but we need to know at least vaguely. So that that's helpful, but it's not, it's not as precise as we would like in today's day and age with all our wonderful geospatial tools. But she's gone in and she's sort of been stuff into basically island type uh, of people that are, are uh, catch that was landed in one of these fishing blocks near the islands or elsewhere. And this is what we see. Uh, uh, we can look at the island take or, or, or the, the guys that clearly came from the island and the guys that clearly came from the blocks adjacent to the mainland. And what do you see? What pattern do you see? The island is where the story is happening, right? That's where we're getting the majority of our spiny lobsters. That's where we're getting virtually all of our urchins. That's where we're getting the vast majority of our crabs and cucumbers. And it goes on and on and on. And uh, if we also look at that compared to the overall statewide uh, landings, again, it's a significant chunk of our overall statewide landings. So ultimately, it's, this says that our Santa Barbara Channel, our little backyard right here where our research station is, all that stuff, is a fantastically important region for commercial, not just for recreational, but specifically for commercial fishing in the state of California especially our northern Channel Islands, where our research station is and, and uh, Channel Islands National Park and the Marine Sanctuary is, et cetera. Fair. But, but, but we'll, we'll pick the, we have not gotten to the wider global picture. Wanted to give you a sense of what's going on here in California. We need to talk about what's going on globally next. 